Good day, folks, and welcome back to the channel. What do we got here? Because I don't buy black bags. Okay. And it looks like you're about to do a magic trick or something. No magic trick today, but bear with me one second here. This is a 1978 Triple Crown Trophy. Really? Yes. How in the world did you get this? I work with the trainer okay. for his family. And so when the opportunity came up, I, I went ahead and made the investment. What are you looking to get out of it? 500000 and normally when someone asks for $500,000 in here, I kind of laugh. <laughs> uh, I, I have no idea what it's worth. Yeah, this is something you just don't really ever get an opportunity to look at and buy. I'm actually shocked that somebody ended up selling it. Here are times when the Pawn Stars came across some holy grail items. Houdini straight jacket. When a man walks into the pawn shop with a creepy straight jacket that he claims belonged to the legendary Houdini, Rick and Corey are skeptical. After William the seller asked for $100,000, Rick decides to call an expert. He's concerned that the jacket was authenticated by an unreliable source, Houdini's brother, who was well known for selling fake items. I have an antique straight jacket. For like crazy people kind of straight jacket? Well, this is not just any straight jacket. This is an original Harry Houdini straight jacket. Okay, it does look Friday the 13th-ish. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so where did you get this thing? This jacket was given to my grandfather by Theo Houdini, Harry Houdini's brother. They became good friends after Houdini passed away. What'd you want to do with it? Uh, I'd like to sell it. And how much do you want for it? Uh, $100,000. Um, we might be talking the right neighborhood. It would be the most collectible Houdini thing there is out there. The problem is Theo Houdini was notorious for selling things that were supposed to belong to Houdini that didn't belong to Houdini. Do you mind if I have someone check it out? Love to. Rick relies on Murray, a professional magician, to determine whether the jacket is the real deal. As everyone watches, Murray uses old photos to prove beyond a doubt that Houdini wore that jacket. He can hardly believe that he got a chance to see and touch a holy grail magical item that was once used by the most famous magician ever. Though the jacket is valued at a shockingly low $40,000, it is priceless. William swallows the disappointment and lowers his asking price to $30,000 but Rick refuses to offer him more than 25,000. So what are the chances of this actually being Houdini's jacket? To prove it, it's like one in a million. Each rivet has a certain space, and these rivets are never gonna match another jacket spacing. Now, a company that he always used a lot was a Swanfeld um, tent and awning company, and generally that stamp is on a jacket. Oh, well, <laughs> Swanfeld Tent and Awning Company. I thought for sure there was no way we could prove this was Houdini's, and now we have a positive clue. I need to find the photograph, which is like a one in a million chance. But this is really Houdini's jacket. This is like the holy grail, I mean, of Houdini. So I'll look at my resources, and I have a huge file of resources, and that'll let me know if I can authenticate this or not. I found the only photographs of a jacket. That's as close as we can get to this jacket. It's the exact same style made by the same company. This is January 1st, 1915 in St. Louis, Missouri. Let's check this thing out, you know, let's see if this is the actual jacket. Unbelievable, look at this. This rivet here is flattened, so is this one. This rivet is raised, that's raised. You can see it in the photo, it's that clear as day. This is actually reflected off the camera, which a flat surface would. This is a great sign. I mean, that's identical. Granted, they could have put the same amount of rivets in jackets, fair enough. You have one stitch, two, three, four, five. Check this out, right there. You know what? This is Houdini's jacket from January 1st, 1915 that in St. Louis. That is absolutely awesome. This is huge. All right, so tell me, what did these things go for? This jacket, I would estimate, would go anywhere between thirty-four dollars and $42,000. OK. Thanks, man. You're the best. Yep. There you go. All right, so how much do you want for it? Uh, you know, if I could get 40, I think we'd have a deal. All right, um, I'm thinking 15. It's in really rough shape. It's had repairs on it. It could be years before I sell this thing. You know, I might, I might go a little less than 40, maybe 35. I'll tell you what, I'll go 25 grand. I mean, that is tops. If, if you could come up to 30, then, then we've got a deal. Um, I'll go, you know, 25 is it. This has been an awesome day. Uh, you know, I think I'll keep it. Okay. I'm always here, man. Awesome. Thank you, guys. 1978 Triple Crown Trophy. 
Corey looks on curiously as Patrick pulls on white gloves to handle a mysterious item wrapped in black velvet. When Corey notices that it is the 1978 Triple Crown Trophy, he immediately knows that he's dealing with one of the Holy Grail sports trophies. This does not stop him from getting a second opinion when Patrick asks for $500,000 for his prized possession. What do we got here? Because I don't buy black bags. Okay. And it looks like you're about to do a magic trick or something. No magic trick today, but bear with me one second here. This is a 1978 Triple Crown Trophy. Really? Yes. You don't look like the size of a jockey. No. <laughs> How in the world did you get this? I work with the trainer okay. or his family. And so when the opportunity came up, I, I went ahead and made the investment. So the bag says Cartier. I'm assuming they made it? Yes, they did. Um, doesn't surprise me. I know uh, Tiffany's makes the Lombardi trophy. Yes. This is damn near the equivalent of somebody coming in here and selling me a Stanley Cup. Pretty much. <laughs> it's kind of a... Only a little more rare. Yeah, I mean, there's, it's only happened about, what, 13 times in history? You know, it's the Kentucky Derby, the Prickness, and the Belmont. Forgive me, I don't really follow horse racing, but I just, I know how big this is. I know it, how rare this is. And it happens to be from a sport I really don't know that much about. So what are you looking to get out of it? 500000 And normally when someone asks for $500,000 in here, I kind of laugh. <laughs> Uh, I, I have no idea what it's worth. Yeah, this is something you just don't really ever get an opportunity to look at and buy. I'm actually shocked that somebody ended up selling it. I'll tell you what, man, I'm, I'm gonna have to call a buddy of mine and take a look at it. Because if you brought me in the Stanley Cup right now, I'm gonna have a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> the trophy is so rare that Dan Wolken, the sports memorabilia expert, admits to never having seen one. He cannot believe that it is not preserved in a museum. Dan assures Corey that the trophy is legal to own. Unfortunately, it is so rare that assigning it a value is tough because none has ever been sold on the open market before. The trophy is appraised at $500,000 by comparing it to how much similarly prestigious trophies have fetched. Corey offers $225,000, but Patrick turns him down without a second thought. As he leaves, Patrick states his willingness to wait for the right buyer for the Holy Grail Sporting Trophy. Hey, Dan, what's up, man? Hey, Corey, how you doing, bud? Here you go. Good to see you. Hey, how you um, doing? Hi, Patrick. Dude, Triple Crown Trophy, I don't even know where to start. Unbelievable. I've actually never seen one. Wow. Like this is supposed to be in a museum. Now, I had a huge question, because I've, I've made the mistake of buying Grammys and Oscars and stuff before, and you're not allowed to own them. And I ended up having to give them back. Is this something that you could even own? The trainer might have passed away, which in this case, Laz Brera passed away in 1991. Families are able to sell trophies to help out with bills and stuff like that. And this is the first time I've ever seen something like this in front of me. I mean, this is, yeah, this I, is incredible. I don't know how to put a value on this. You're right. It's tough to put a value as far as comparing this to other big trophies. In my career, none of these have ever come out to the market, to the public. Comparing other trophies, you know, what they go for, this is worth $500,000. I mean, is there a market for it? The horse racing collectibles market is a small niche and there will be someone that will come out eventually that's looking for something of this high caliber that just needs to have something that no one else has. Okay, um, well my man, I really appreciate it. You got it, absolutely. So you heard what Dan said, I might be able to get 500,000 for it. That's at an auction with the right buyer and I gotta sell it to a guy who wants a trophy he didn't win. Um, you willing to come down from that number a little bit or? I really need to get 500,000 for it. I'm around 125. It's pretty far off. Would you go 225? I really need to get five for it. I think 225 is gonna be the most I can do on it. I really can't go below 500,000. I really can't pay more than 225. I appreciate you coming down though. All right, thank, thank you. you. 1861 double eagle $20 coin. When a criminal leaves a bail bondsman stranded by skipping his court date, Rick ends up with a holy grail American coin. The bail bondsman wants $50,000 for the coin to recover the amount he lost. Rick and the old man inspect the coin carefully. Rick's heart skips a beat when he realizes the rare coin could be worth a whopping quarter million dollars. They call an expert who inspects the coin and confirms that it is authentic. I'm John, I'm a local bail bondsman. I had a guy skip out on me on a $50,000 bail, and I was trying to see what I can get out of this to pay the bond. So he skipped on you, huh? Yes, sir. <laughs> no laughing yeah. matter. Yeah, life is a bitch sometimes. <laughs> so do you know much about the coin? Not much. I thought it was pretty good condition. 
but uh, I was hoping you could tell me. Was this grated at one time? Or? Uh, no, I've never had it grated. You mind if I pull this out of the plastic? Because it's not grated. Doesn't doesn't really matter pulling this one out. Don't drop it. Put down my little safety pad. Appreciate it. Appreciate <laughs> it. Thank you. How's it looking, son? I mean, it's in pretty damn good shape. The U.S. Mint started making these coins in 1849, and they continued to make them for over 80 years. But there were design changes along the way, and this appears to be the original Liberty Head. And it was a big deal to have one of these back then, because $20 was a ton of money. What I can tell you about this coin is it appears to be real. This is uncirculated, mint state. This is a very expensive coin. The reason this one is worth so much money is because this was a really low mintage year. Mm. There's 11 different grades of mint state from mm. MS60 to MS70. Mm. The difference between a 61 and a 63 is the difference between 10,000 and 40,000. There's also a variant of this coin that's worth right around a quarter of a million dollars in the shape. Really? Rick, we might have the Holy Grail of coins here. I like that. I like that a lot. There's a possibility. Uh -huh. I'd like someone to look at it who just knows a little bit more than me. Sure. So do you mind uh, hanging out for a little bit and I can get somebody down here? Sure. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. A $20 lib. When we had the 1849 gold rush, America had a substantial gold supply. They started issuing the $20 gold piece up till, till then they only had the $10 gold piece. So that's why they call it a double eagle versus a eagle, which was a $10 gold piece. They made one pattern in 1849, the year of the gold rush, and that's uh, sitting in the Smithsonian today and basically priceless. And then in 1850, they started issuing $20 gold piece, uh, the Liberty. It was the highest denomination gold people had out there, $20. Okay. The variant is distinguishable by the back. It was a design which was not accepted, but some of them were issued as patterns. There's less of them, and that's what makes the coin rare. Okay, so is this it? We'll look on the reverse, and that's how you could tell with the tall letters and the shield variation and the larger wingspan. Unfortunately, you do not have here. Uh, I am sorry. Okay. Unfortunately, it is not the rare $250,000 version. He values it at $40,000 due to its high grade rarity, and excellent quality. The bail bondsman is so excited that he rejects Rick's offer of $30,000. He and Rick haggle over the price until the old man eventually approves a $34,000 or the holy grail of coin collection. Looks very high grade off the cuff. Very, very minor scratches on the whole coin. Good body, very slight wear. This definitely is a MS-63 or better coin, which would minimally be worth $40,000. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot, Andrew. I really appreciate it. So what do you want to do with it? Pawn it or sell it? Sell it. How much you want for it? You heard the man. 40 grand. Uh, I'm thinking more like 30 grand. And that's cash. Well, you said it was worth 40, and I definitely need the money. Um, how about 35? Um... You know you're gonna make five grand off it. I'm not necessarily gonna make it five grand. I plan on making five grand. Uh, the, uh, plans don't always come out nah. as planned. So how about 33? 34, you got a deal. What do you think? I'm gonna go for it. What the hell? Good All right, 34,000. Fantastic. All right, Very let's good. go write this thing up. Very good.